I may be talking about the work of about a thousand people who sit on the shoulders of a lot of other people. And so this is, don't think of me as the sole proprietor of this thing. Let me start by showing you the man who started it all. That gentleman is Isaac Newton. And many of you know about him because of the equation he has down the bottom there. I'm not asking that you solve that equation. Uh, but I am asking you to listen to me a little about it. It's a very good equation. It says the force of two objects that are affected by gravity <clears throat> is proportional to some constant, big G. Let's not worry about that. But most important part is it's proportional to the mass of one object and the mass of the other. That's what's in the numerator. And it gets weaker and weaker as the square of the distance. And that law, by the way, is the thing that Newton discovered worked on the ground for something that dropped on the ground, but it also worked spectacularly well for things in the heavens. And that association makes Newton a famous man to make that association in the first place. But it turns out it's a flawed relationship. And it's what's where it's wrong is when you begin to think about how quickly information travels in the gravitational field, or if things move very, very fast. It's not so flawed that you can't get people to the moon with that equation. But if you want to do something more subtle, like make your GPS work on your cell phone, you've got to do better than that equation. So you come along, and here is Albert Einstein, uh, with a completely different equation. I, I'm not going to ask you to solve that equation. I can barely solve it myself. That's, in fact, I can't. Let's be honest about it. <laughs> but the, uh, the thing is that it says something different, which is very different. There's no force anymore. That big G that's on the left is the geometry of space and time. And somehow, the 8 pi we all understand, but the next thing, that big T, is related to the mass and energy that is in that space. And that is not, there's no more gravitational force. It's a brand new idea. And that incorporates some new ideas, which I'll show you as best as I can in this picture. I don't know how many of you know what a jungle gym looks like, but I'm assuming you do. If you come from New York, you definitely know what a jungle gym is. And what has been done here is a cut has been taken through the jungle gym. And that's all those little squares you're seeing. And if you look at that, they were all squares that were nice and square to begin with. This is a two-dimensional cut through the gym. And uh, on top of that, what you don't see, because I didn't draw it in there, are every little intersection of those lines has a little clock on it. And what ha what if you had the clocks there, you would notice that all the clocks kept the same time where around you, where the nice, where the things haven't yet gotten curvy looking. But those things, when you get near the curvy things, which are in this case induced by the sun, that big yellow thing, and then there's a little dimple that's made in it by the Earth, which is over to the right. I hope you can see that. And those dimples, that distortion of space and the distortion of time is the way Einstein would describe gravi gravity. And then what happens is those distortions tell matter how to move around in the space. It's a completely different view of the way you think about gravity, and it incorporates this idea which was essential to what we discovered, and that's gravitational waves. And what are gravitational waves? I'll try to show you what they are. They are things that are generated by masses that accelerate. Not things that move at constant speed, but things that are getting faster with time. They, velocity changes with time. That's the kind of thing that makes gravitational waves. The other thing that they have properties of is that they believe, and Einstein believed, they would move at the propagation speed of light. The speed of light. That's what the whole... And now I want to show you they're transverse waves. What does that mean? I'll try to show you that now. They're like the waves you have in your bathtub, or you see on the surface of a lake. And let me start this by those dots are little masses that have been spread all over space. You're at that place in the middle where there's a little red square. I don't know if you can see it. I can see it in my monitor here. And you'll notice two properties of that particular thing. All those dots measure the, what's happening to space. The time is also being changed, but we're not going to talk about that for a moment. And so what happens here is you'll notice an interesting thing. You play the dots. There's some dots that are coming together, and some that are spreading apart, and that keeps flipping. So you notice in the up and down direction and in the sideways direction, there are always opposite motions, expansion in one, contraction in the other. Can you see that, I hope? Good. The other property is that the further our, the dots are away from the little red dot in the middle, the more they wiggle, the more they move. 
The dots right, right close to the red spot, they don't move much. The ones that are far apart, they move a lot. And that's all you need to know about gravitational waves to understand why, how you might detect them. We'll learn a little bit more about how they get accelerated and where that acceleration comes from at the end and how we now have seen systems that make these waves. But let me show you how you detect the waves. And this is a little mock-up. Think of a gravitational wave like the one you just saw coming down on that picture, okay? And that little round thing is a laser. It makes laser light. The thing that's not, that's the next thing over, I, I, could, I wish I could point, but is a beam splitter which splits the light. You'll see that in a minute. And then your dots that, if you want to imagine in the picture I, you just show, I just showed you, imagine that red square around that thing called the beam splitter, which is that thing in the middle. And then the dots are those two mirrors that are way at the ends. And then there's a detector. Let's start the thing. And you'll see why it'll get a little clearer to you once. Here's the laser making light. Wherever there's red, there's light. And the wiggly thing in the light is the electromagnetic wave that is making the light. We have to watch that. It hits the mirror, comes back, and it comes back to the beam splitter. The beam splitter is like a halfway mirror. And now you have both sides have spent equal amounts of time for the light, and they go to the detector on the right, and there's no light at the detector. You can see the lights cancel. Why? Because of the wave nature of light. Now comes the gravitational wave down. It comes down on this thing. It stretches one arm and then stretches the other arm. And it makes light come at the detector because the time it takes light to go the two paths is no longer exactly equal. That's the basis of the whole concept of how these gravitational waves were detected. Now the trouble, as you'll see in a minute, is this one. That guy on the left is Kip Thorne, who is another one of the Nobel Prize winners, also very famous for making a movie called Interstellar. How many of you have seen that? A lot of you, OK. And there he is doing something crazy with a, la with a laser. It's not my favorite picture of him. But, and, uh, but in that are some equations which I'll just describe to you. That thing we were just talking about in the gravitational wave, I call it H. It's that symbol H. It's the change in length. It's that motion that you saw of the dots divided by their separation. and that is a constant in that picture. It changes sign, but it's always the same. Things that are very close together, they don't move much. Things that are very far apart, they move a lot. That's what that, exp that expression says. And, at, and what you saw was a huge amount of motion. What Kip told us very early was that the, if you're going to try to measure a gravitational wave, the best you're going to ever see, if you're going to even have a hope for seeing it, you have to measure a strain of 10 to the minus 21. What is that? That's a decimal point with 20 zeros, point oh, 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 keep on going. And then there's a one. It's a tiny, tiny number. And that tiny number can be expressed in other ways. How well with the light do you have to measure the motion of those masses? Well, one part in a million times, a million times smaller than the wavelength of light itself. That's what those bottom two equations say. And you and I, all in here in this room, are shaking around ourselves by about a millionth of a millionth of the wavelength of light. So you have to get rid of a lot of problems first before you can do this. And that took about 40 years. So how then was, this is the next development in this thing was, these detectors were placed all over the world. And the ones that made the detection first, and the one you're going to see some results from other ones in the United States, there's one in Hanford, that's in Washington State, another one in Louisiana. But there are other detectors. There's one in Italy, in Virgo. It's another detector of the same kind. There's one that's almost ready to run, Kagra, which is in, in, in Japan. And then there's one being built in India. And that's a whole network, and you'll see in a minute why it's important to have a network. Now, a quick uh, look of what things look like. This is LIGO looking down. You're looking down on LIGO in, in Louisiana here. And uh, oh, no, I shouldn't have done that. Oh, yes, I should have. OK, it's now going to run. OK, good. That's, that's, that was LIGO in, in Louisiana. That's LIGO in Washington State. Big, this is a big concrete cover over the vacuum system in both Louisiana and in, and in Hanford. Here's what the vacuum system is. a very good vacuum in there. The laser beams go back and forth in that. Here's a table which people work on to make the apparatus work. It looks just like a lab here at, at MIT or at Harvard or Tufts, wherever. And here's a control room and people learning how to run the thing. And uh, so that's, the, that's your tour of LIGO. <laughs> and now here is the thing that we discovered. This is a little tricky. You'll have to just follow me a little bit. The horizontal axis is time, and the vertical axis is the strain that was measured by these instruments. And you'll see two different curves in there, a blue one, which was the one that was measured in Louisiana, and a, a yellow one that was measured at Hanford. And there had, they had to be slid a little bit so they would match each other by about seven milliseconds, seven thousandths of a second. But you can see something. It's junk on the left. 
and junk all the way on the right. That's just noise. But something in the middle is building up and building up and building up. And what, well, that, what, what that was, was two black holes weighing 30 solar masses, 30 times what the mass of the sun is, doing a dance in space one billion years ago, going around each other, and they smash into each other at the end of that waveform. That's what was going on. And uh, I want to give it to you in another way. Here's a way that, another way to talk about it. This is the time on the bottom axis again. And now, instead of the horizontal axis being the strain, it's the sound you might hear, the frequency of the sound. So 256, most of you probably know, 256 hertz is the middle C on a piano. And you can see the waveform on the right, is the, the brighter the thing is, the more sound there is at that frequency. But you can see a little chirp at the end there. And now I'll try to play it for you. Let's see what happens. Doesn't sound like much. Bloop. That's all, right? Let's try again with a change in the wave. Well, that, we tricked it up a little bit. That was so that you could hear it better. But that's a chirp. And that is, as these things get closer and closer, they go faster and faster, and they smash into each other. OK, so now, here is, we've discovered many more than one. And now all the different black hole pairs we've now discovered, about 10 of them. They're not all in that picture. But that instrument and people in Europe have also, with us, measured many black hole pairs. So they're now become common part of our astronomical heritage. And now here is something which is pretty new and also interesting in its own right. What it is is now that you know a little about this, look at the bottom picture, the blue picture at the bottom. And now it's the time is much longer. Those seconds are marked off in seconds. And that yellow thing you see, that, that thing that you see, is this, again the, the sound that's made by two objects which we now know are two neutron stars. Those are stars that are made of nuclear matter. They've been going around each other for eons. These guys were 160 million light years away, very close to us, OK? <laughs> and uh, really close. And, uh, and, but they smashed into each other. And here's what that sounded like. OK? That's a chirp, a real nice chirp. By the way, that's a fake. Uh, that's not the real sound that would have more noise in it like the other one did. That's a made up. Curve. But the other part of that picture is sort of interesting. The upper, the upper parts, if you see a line that goes vertically in it, you'll see that there's a very top picture is a picture of a gamma ray telescope in space that picked up this thing also. And this was very exciting for all of us. Not only did the gravitational wave detector see it, that's the blue thing in the bottom, but people with a gamma ray telescope saw it, and they saw it about 1.7 seconds later. Now, that 1.7 seconds isn't, is, 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 is interesting in its own, but at 140 million years away, it hardly matters. It says to you right away that light and, and, and gravitational waves travel at the same speed to a part in 10 to the 15. You might as well say they travel at the velocity of light. And that fact that an electromagnetic device, a device that sees electromagnetic waves, actually also saw the gravitational waves was very important. And it did the following. Here's a picture of the sky. Those banana-like looking things are places in the sky where we thought maybe the source is. We don't know very well. That's, our instruments don't do that. A, the, the, the gamma ray telescope found that big blue blob. And then on the right, once people were told about this, they, with telescopes, they were able to find the following. Look on the right. And you will see on a picture that was taken 20 days before the event, and there's uh, some stars in it and a galaxy. And then you little see two little straight lines up at about 11 o'clock. And now you look about 10 hours after, and lo and behold, there's a new bright spot there. And that was the first identification, optical identification, which then changed the character of science. Because now we now know what it is. We know that it is, for example, in that picture, you see that there are two neutron stars coming together, the blue things. They make a new black hole. They send off gamma rays. And they make a hell of a cloud of nuclear matter all over space. And that was extremely interesting to everybody and started a whole new field called multi messenger astronomy, and gravitational waves are part of it. But all the other astronomies are part of this, too. And one of the more interesting discoveries that was made, I won't dwell on this, but many of you know a little bit about chemistry because you've seen this periodic table before, I hope. But we always suspected we knew where all the elements of the universe were made. 
We thought they were made either in the early explosion of the universe or in stars themselves. And we missed out where the heavy elements were made. The things like gold and platinum, the things that are gold. All the gold and platinum that is in the universe is made in these collisions of two neutron stars. Okay? So that might have significance for you. Uh, and then here is then the last picture. I just want to quickly just say this is sort of where the field is heading. And uh, this is a picture which I, it's too complicated. I shouldn't have even showed it to you, but there it is. Uh, what it is is that there's the frequency of the gravitational waves on the top is time. And different, uh, different types of measurements are being made at different wavelengths of gravitational waves. That's going on. Some of it is going on now. I'll quickly just tell you what they are. On the right is the high frequencies. That's the things like what you were listening to. And that's LIGO and Virgo and those things on the ground. And the blue thing that's a little bit over goes from hours to minutes of gravitational waves. And that's a gra satellite project called LISA. And that's going to be done in the, in the 30s, 2030s. Then there's an experiment going on timing pulsars. I won't go into it. You can use the clocks on stars to look for uh, gravitational waves. And finally, the thing all the way on the left is a very grand experiment that uses the cosmic background radiation, which is the radiation that was rem remnant of the explosion that made everything. And you can use characteristics of that explosion to look for primeval, primordial gravitational waves that happened at the instant the universe was created. Thank you.